the Shark Deck. Hello, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Going to flip the order around a little bit. I watched Shane Gillis's new special on Netflix. Beautiful Dogs is the name of that one if you haven't seen it. I loved it. I found Shane to be just so personable and having a good time just up there. And he knows it's all fun and silly. And you can tell he's enjoying that you're enjoying it. It feels like you're at the tavern and you ran into a guy who's had maybe two and a half beverages and is a little loose and telling some funny stories. And the guy's just fun to be around. I liked it a lot. As I watched it, I was like, is this the best special of the year? And by the end, I decided it's the second best special of the year. I'll give you the updated top 10 in a minute. Uh, I I think part of that, this keeps happening to me. So I go downstairs and I watch a comedy special. Now, a comedy special is an hour, no matter how long it is. But, you know, it's an hour in concept. And it has a flow, right? You, you, You start... I remember George Carlin's manager, Jerry Hamza, explained to me one time the way Carlin would work is he would come out and do a bunch of rat-a-tat-tat jokes in that real quick Carlin. Hey, you ever notice something, something punchline? He'd do a bunch of those. And then George would go into a long flowing thing, you know, one of those long, especially late in his career, long rants, making a point and then come back and do a little rat-a-tat-tat and then leave with a big thought. So comedians will craft a set. But what happens is I'm watching it. I'm having a good time. And my wife comes down. And then she'll be like, is he funny? And already I'm like, yes, yes, he's funny. And then she'll stand there and it'll be in the middle of something that has clearly been set up 25 minutes ago. And she'll just kind of have a vibe of I'm not enjoying this. And what happened when I was watching this the other night, she starts sweeping the basement. So I'm sitting there and there's this woman just going. So I just I hit pause. I'm like, really? So I don't know, Shane, you might have had to run it number one. (laughs) <laughs> but I was interrupted. I like Shane's special a lot. I also put on Luanel's special. I lasted two minutes, 10 seconds. I could tell right away this was not going to be for me. I wanted to hit stop after, I don't know, four seconds. And I hung in there and I was like, no, not feeling this at all. Uh, my opinion, Netflix clearly wants to be in the Dave Chappelle business. Dave executive produced that one. I'm not sure how well that one's going to do. Let's look at the updated list of best of 2023. According to Johnny Mac, the best special of the year is... Todd Barry's Domestic Short Air. You'll find that on YouTube. Shane Gillis pops in at number two. Tom Segura, three, four. Kyle Kinane, five. Nate Bergatzi. That came out back in January on Amazon. Six, Michelle Wolf. Seven, Jay McBride's Daddy's Girl. That's on YouTube. Eight, Jim Jeffries from Amazon in February. Hari Kondabolu at nine. That was on YouTube. And Chris Rock. Remember, he had a big special. It was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I'm more fascinated with my not on the list. The not on the list includes releases by Jim Gaffigan. John Mulaney, Louis Black, Mark Marin, and I've been on a big Mark Marin kick lately. Bert Kreischer, I didn't love the middle nor the end of that special. Andrew Santino, Kevin Hart, Lou and Els. So a uh, bit of a comedy snob, Johnny Mac. Vulture put out their comics to watch list. I am recording this a little after 11 a.m. on Monday, and I just saw the list. I think it came out in the 10 o'clock hour. Haven't dived into it, and I have a lot to cover today, so I'll get to that. But I did share the link in the Facebook group, which is Daily Comedy News Podcast Group, if you want to check out that. And I'll talk about that in the next few days. I listened to David Letterman on the Strike Force 5 podcast. I love Letterman so much, and this just reminded me of the old 1230 Letterman because they were talking a lot about those days and his old NBC daytime show, the one that failed spectacularly. A couple tidbits that uh, I didn't know before. NBC had approached David Letterman to host the Monday and Tuesday episodes of The Tonight Show, and Johnny Carson would have done the other three. And Letterman asked, does Johnny know you're talking to me about this? And the answer was no. And then Letterman said, no, not having this conversation. That was interesting. The guys kept asking Letterman questions, and Dave doesn't want to talk about himself. So they might ask him, I don't know, who was your favorite guest of all time? Yeah, you know, I know there's so many. Who was your favorite guest? And he kept, whatever they asked him, he threw it back on them. I thought that was interesting. And if you pay a lot of attention to these episodes, especially the Letterman one, there's this vibe that Jimmy Fallon is the little brother of the group. Almost as if the others are like, eh, I don't know if Fallon's up to our level here. They keep making fun of him for the newlywed game type thing that Fallon did a couple episodes back. They talked about that a lot on the Letterman episode. And okay, fine, that's just some chop busting. Um, but they also just keep making fun of his questions. At one point, Fallon asked Letterman a question, and they all made fun of the way it was phrased. And you kind of hear a knock on Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show that he's not the best interviewer in the world. And, and, and maybe I'm just sensitive to this now, a lot of alcohol references, a lot of stories with Jimmy drinking a beer. So, hmm... 
The late night shows returned last night. I'm still wondering if NBC is considering making a change at 1130. We'll see. We'll talk about late night's return tomorrow. John Oliver returned on Sunday night. And during the first 15 minutes-ish of his show, he went in on the writer strike. Oliver said, I'd have loved to have covered all these stories back when they originally happened. I wish so much I could have told you these jokes at the time, but I couldn't because our writers, the people who wrote these jokes, were forced to strike for a fair contract for the last five months. And while I'm happy that they eventually got a fair deal and immensely proud of what our union accomplished, I'm also furious that it took the studios 148 days to achieve a deal that they could have offered on day effing one. But hopefully, this might encourage others, from auto workers to Starbucks baristas to healthcare providers, whether they're in unions or would like to be, to find power in each other. Some of the jokes that he had missed out on while away. On Trump's mugshot, he said, Trump looks like he's struggling to find Waldo in the crowd. On the coronation of King Charles, quote, the world's oldest boy, Oliver joked he was aiming for a successful pimp, but ends up looking like someone wearing a set of tacky drapes over a Lakers jersey. (laughs) Oliver talked about when Reddit unveiled a policy that charged third-party apps, and as John explains it, for weeks, images of me were used as a form of protest on some of the most popular subreddits. He showed a bunch of pictures of himself, one looking like a Muppet, another that made him look like John Wick. This one labeled John Oliver Wick, which is a pretty good way of showing you exactly what would happen if Professor Snape ever committed armed robbery. And he joked about Fallout Boy's cover of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. Oliver said, for what it's worth, We Didn't Stop the Fire is the last song anyone should cover from Billy Joel's discography. Even if it's original form, it's the musical equivalent of a child telling you everything he learned to do at school that day. Slow down, but also, I don't care. Oh, one more about uh, Lauren Boebert attending Beetlejuice and some stuff happened there. Uh, This next sentence is PG. If uh, you're driving around with kids, why don't you hit 30 seconds, skip four times. Okay, ready? Oliver said, I'm not saying it would be appropriate to engage in high school freshman era hand stuff during the production of any musical, but I just wanted to be absolutely clear. This wasn't one of the more explicitly sexual ones like Spring Awakening or Rocky Horror or Cats. This was Beetlejuice, a song that is quite loudly about death. (laughs) I'm just saying, if you're going to get your nipples tweaked and your pipe squeaked, you save that for Fiddler on the Roof like an adult. (laughs) Oh, Bill Maher was back as well. He said, first of all, I want to thank everybody who made this possible to be back. You know, I'm talking about my brilliant staff, writers and non-writers who scramble the jets so it could be on in two days, and the union folks who expedited the paperwork so we could get back quickly. So thank you. Pete Davidson reportedly swide swiped his car against a wall on Saturday night after leaving his comedy show. Page six reports there was another man in the passenger seat and three people in the back seat. Pete's driving four people around. What's going on? According to the story, Pete's car was apparently scraped from the middle door to the start of the back wheel. In some photos, Pete appears to be holding a cigarette and shielded his face from the paparazzi. You may recall Pete Davidson was recently charged with reckless driving in July and was supposed to complete 50 hours of community service. This Trevor Noah thing is fascinating. I've been talking about his tour of India, and more and more stories keep coming out. Again, from the Indian Express, your home for comedy news, Trevor said, You know, sometimes you feel like something's about to happen, and it does. That happened to us in Bengaluru. We're driving to the venue. After about an hour and a half of driving, I was like, Where are we going? The driver and everyone in the car was like, This is the way we're supposed to go. At some point, the driver turned onto a dirt road. Trevor said, Where is this? Am I performing in the past? Where am I going? And they drove us to this venue. Noah said when he usually goes for a show backstage, what happens is there'll be like an entrance you walk into, you emerge in a backstage area before you come and perform. Here, we walk through an alley that was full of dogs, half of which were in cages. Some of the dogs are outside, others are in. What have these dogs done? That's what I want to know. I have never prepared for a show with a backstage area with dogs in cages. Trevor said the venue technically was a building. But the room he was in looked like a semi-permanent tent with giant air conditioner units on the side making a loud noise. They tried to turn the sound up so you could hear what's happening, but because the room wasn't designed for human beings, what happens is the sound waves are bouncing around the room in every direction. That's fantastic. So I noticed on Sunday night as I was doing some prep, Skankfest was over the weekend. Um, Now, maybe you think I suck. We're 10 minutes in, so you probably don't think I suck that bad if you're still hearing my voice right now. But maybe you're like, this podcast sucks and I just hate listen. I do try and prep for it. I do look up the news. Like these words I'm saying don't just come from nowhere. God doesn't go, here is the comedy news. Like I do some research here. And I was like, Skankfest was this weekend? There was nothing about Skankfest. Here, I challenge you, go to Google and type in Skankfest and tell me what comes up. Yeah, they have a website, and there's one article from a Las Vegas paper, which is the one I saw that went, oh, it was this weekend? There were some big names at this thing. 
Robert Kelly, Ari Shafir, Dan Soder, TJ Miller, Mark Norman, Joe List, Tim Dillon. That's just some of the names that were there. Now, I know the Skank guys, they've got all their podcasts and they go on each other's podcasts. And I'm sure the festival was amazing. And I'm sure they sold every ticket. And I'm sure it was great. But that there's nothing on the Internet, no articles, both before or after, no coverage of this thing. Is that what you want to do? You want to have a festival nobody talks about? It? Very, very strange. Again, I'm in your corner, Skankfest. I think your festival is a lot of fun, but I don't know. Let's tell somebody about it. Congratulations to Eliza Schlesinger. She has another baby on the way. Eliza is 40. She's expecting her second baby, a son, to be born in February. On Instagram, we see Eliza Schlesinger surprising a couple during their sex reveal by popping out of a box the couple expected balloons to come out of. After explaining the environmental dangers of the practice... Eliza shared her own baby news. I have a balloon story in a second. Eliza told people that filming the bit revealing her own news was so fun. My friends pitched in. I try to use my platform to advocate for the environment as much as I can. Sex reveals and baby celebrations can be done so irresponsibly. So I just wanted to bring awareness to that while making a point about simply having a baby is special enough. There's no need to get the fire department involved. Okay, balloon story. <laughs> so on Sunday, a uh, local town has this street festival that I like a lot. And I'm walking around. All of a sudden, a balloon hits me chest high and I just grab it. And I'm like, this must be some child's balloon. And I look around and there's no children. I don't know where this balloon came from. And so I grab it because I just have issues. You know how we all have issues from when we were children? So when I was a child, if I ever lost my balloon and it went up to the sky, I would freak out. Anytime I see a balloon, like a child lose a balloon, I get really sad. So I'm holding on to this balloon and I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Because I can't just let it go. I will be traumatized. I'm walking around the festival and I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'll see a kid and I'll be like, hey, kid, do you want a balloon? I'm like, well, that's kind of creepy. Why is this middle aged man handing balloons to kids? So I just I walk around with this balloon for the whole festival and I'm like, I guess I'll bring it home. And I get back to the car and I put it in the car and I start driving home playing with the radio, listening to some music, and I'm driving, and all of a sudden, the balloon that I had forgotten about, I see it come from the back seat, and it starts to approach the front seat, and then it suddenly goes up, because Johnny Mac left the sunroof open. I want to thank Travis, who went to buymeacoffee.com slash daily comedy news and bought me not one, but two iced coffees. I was thinking of Travis on Monday as I was driving to the National Donuts chain. I was like, oh, yeah, Travis hooked this up and I'm going to thank him the next time I record. And I was like, you know what? I'll do a live thank you from the parking lot of the National Donuts chain. I took out my phone and I recorded myself walking into the National Donuts chain where three different people and I we exchanged pleasantries. Hey, you have a great day, too. I saw one of my kid's friends who said, hi, Mr. McD. I had all this on recording and I came back to put the show together and I'll be like, oh, Travis is going to be so impressed that I actually put extra effort into this thing. And I never hit record. But I do have a second recording of me uh, opening the car door and breathing heavy and closing the door and starting the car. If you want to hear that, Travis, uh, <laughs> you go to buymeacoffee.com slash daily comedy news support the show. Travis, thank you for being a dedicated listener and appreciate the coffees. This one cracked me up. The headline from the AV Club, Bob's Burgers Season 14 Review. A dozen years in, the show hasn't lost any of its luster. OK, the headline Bob's Burgers Season 14 Review. Got it? OK. So I'm going to ask you two questions if you're a new listener. First question, have you ever seen Bob's Burgers? The answer is no, you actually haven't. But what's weirder is, have you ever met anyone who has seen Bob's Burgers? The answer to that is also no. Now, I understand that the show appears to be a show and there's articles about it and there's merch and they promote it during the football games, but it's clearly a hoax and it cracked me up that uh, the hosters were like, oh, you know when we'll say Bob's Burgers that nobody actually has ever seen is back? We'll put it up against the Taylor Swift football game. Yeah. So, like, they knew we were all watching Taylor Swift at a football game, and not one of us was going to pop over to Fox to see if Bob's Burgers actually ever airs, which it doesn't. I'm sure Fox had a test pattern up, up against Taylor Swift, but they were like, yeah, Bob's Burgers is on season 14. But here's what's weird from the AV Club headline. Again, that headline, Bob's Burgers Season 14 Review. The first sentence is, over the course of its 12 years on the air. I thought this was Season 14. How does that work? Did they just not do a Season 13 because it's unlucky? Did whoever's behind this hoax uh, mess up? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, the AV Club says, give it enough time on the air. Any show, no matter how beloved, is bound to lose its flavor. But somehow, even after all this time, Bob's never has. 14 seasons in. Over the last 12 years, however that math works, the bloom isn't off the blooming onion. 
and we hope we'll be bellying up to the burger counter for many years to come. Uh Uh-huh. Not falling for it. Hey, you know who has a new book today? Sarah Cooper. Remember Sarah Cooper, longtime listeners? She, during the pandemic, was pantomiming to Donald Trump, and then Netflix gave her a comedy special. Remember Sarah Cooper? She's got a new book. It's called Foolish, Tales of Assimilation, Determination, and Humiliation. The description of Sarah Cooper's book is about you. Cooper, a recently ascended star, having utilized the internet to get famous with her pointed, withering performance-based political satire, possesses a direct and fierce comic voice, and in her previous books, she took down cultural dinosaurs here. She explores, thoroughly examines, and mocks herself, her past, and her motivations, and shows how you, too, can find your voice, comic, and otherwise, and use it to exercise your demons. If you're in New York City, Matt Golditch is taping his album tonight at Caveat... He may even be joined by a very special guest. That's an interesting tease there. If you're like, who's Matt Golditch? He's a longtime writer for Late Night with Seth Meyers. Hmm. And Robin Williams' daughter, Zelda, is getting annoyed about artificial intelligence. She said, I've witnessed for years how many people want to train these models to create and recreate actors who cannot consent like my dad, Robin Williams. This isn't theoretical. It's very, very real. I've already heard AI used to get his, quote, voice, unquote, to say whatever people want. And while I find it personally disturbing, the ramifications go far beyond my own feelings. Living actors deserve a chance to create characters with their choices, to voice cartoons, to put their human effort and time into the pursuit of performance. These recreations are at their very best, a poor facsimile of greater people, but at their worst, a horrendous Frankensteinian monster cobbled together from the worst bits of everything this industry is instead of what it should stand for. And that's your comedy news for today. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. Tell a friend about it. Also, check out Ghost Scary Stories Daily. Digging that one. One ghost story a day for all of October. See you tomorrow.